Okay, thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm Carlo Rabelli, and uh, the, the, the title decided last minute is uh, Space Time or Not Question Mark uh, in Loop Quantum Gravity. So, what I'm going to do, <coughs> I have two lectures today and tomorrow. Um, I think that to, today's lecture will go over tomorrow quite a lot. Uh, tomorrow I wanted to talk about a, a new idea, a rather new idea, it's one year old, a little bit more, um, about uh, the, the past hypothesis, the original, the, the early entropy of the universe. Um, but this is somehow marginal with respect to the theme of the conference, so it might get squeezed uh, and give more space to that. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is um, space and time in so I'm going to address uh, many of the questions that uh, uh, Chris raised this morning. What happened to space and time in quantum gravity? Uh, is there space uh, in the, at the fundamental level? Is there time? Uh, if not, in which sense? Uh, um, do they emerge in some classical limit? In which sense they emerge? Does their eventual uh, non-absence uh, no presence uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, threatens the empirical co consistency, coherency, uh, what did you call this morning, um, of the theory. Do we really, as Chris uh, hinted this morning, need to go through the classical limit to recover the possibility of empirically testing, uh, in a sense, give meaning um, to the theory or not? Um, uh, I will. Uh, I'm going to address all these questions. These questions are in part uh, physical questions, in part philosophical questions. Uh, I do make the distinction. Um, they're both. Uh, I think that uh, they makes, it makes sense to address these questions uh, in the context of the physical theory, uh, because, because we're always doing that, in a sense. So we cannot do it not in the context of physical theory. And uh, in the context of, of, of what we know about the world and in the context of trying about the world, so what I'm doing is discussing this question within loop quantum gravity. So how do all this plays out in the context of loop quantum gravity? Now why do it for loop quantum gravity? Uh, well first because I like this theory, uh, I think it's the right one, um, I'm not sure it's the right one, obviously, uh, but it's the one that seems to me has more uh, chances of being the right one. Um, but you may not buy this, and I understand you may not buy it. Nevertheless, um, it's, uh, it is unique in, 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 in a sense uh, in the landscape of attempts to, uh, to do quantum gravity. So let me just say a word about uh, um, where we are in, in quantum gravity. Uh, as Chris said this morning, everybody disagrees about everything. Um, but there are uh, uh, a number of attempts and uh, there is a rather uh, sharp distinction between uh, 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 loop quantum gravity and string theory on the one hand, uh, which are uh, rather largely developed uh, uh, theories in which you can do calculation, you have a large number of people working from various aspects of the theory, uh, being applied to this physical situation, to this physical situation, to this physical situation, you know a lot about these theories, more or less complete and a number of other uh, attempts uh, which are uh, factually right, enormously less developed, uh, usually developed by a group of two or three people, uh, and are very far away from providing a tentative theory of quantum gravity. They're hints, first steps toward, toward that. Now, a lot of, more people do string than loops, uh, uh, also because by string theory you mean a lot of things. Um, so on the one hand you may say, well, string theory is a, is a more interesting uh, 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 ground for looking at what people are doing in, in, in quantum gravity. I think that look quantum gravity is still uh, a more interesting ground because for, for, for the following reason, string theory, from the perspective of philosophers, seems to me, has two uh, uh, shortcomings. One, the majority of people who does string theory do not do quantum gravity. Do not do quantum gravity. They do S. Uh, string theory is a large constellation of uh, techniques uh, 
which right now are much more applied to you know, develop calculation for uh, uh, QCD, calculation technique for QCD, or doing plasma physics, or finding solution of the Einstein equations. Um, and even those who actually work in string theory, which are a small subgroup of the string theory community, uh, are more interested in, uh, in, uh, in unification and more interested in... Uh, you, you have to really search for finding in the string community people who actually are uh, interested in the quantum property of space-time, in what happens to space, uh, to space and time. And even for those, um, there's a big difference. String theory doesn't have a foundation. You cannot say, okay, these are the fundamental equations of string theory at the basic level. This is how to interpret them. This is what is there, this is what not. Yeah, that's totally missing the string. That, that, that's a weak part of the string theory. LQG is at the stage in which, uh, has got to the stage in which there is a set of basic equations, I'll flush them down later on. These are the equation of the theory. Um, maybe they're not final, maybe they're wrong, but this is a theory, and that's how you interpret it. That's where space is, that's where time is, that's where it is not. It is not. It is, uh, that's how you go to the classical limit, that's how you can do measurement, that's what it means. And then the question is that, well, maybe the theory is incomplete, maybe it's empirically false. So let's try it. Let's see. So that's why I, uh, I say, if you want to think about space and time and quantum gravity, that's a, a, a possible place where to look. That's the theory which is uh, today at the stage uh, where you can ask, the question, or ask all the questions. And I'm going to ask the question I said before. Where is space, where is time, and uh, how it merges, and does it and so on? Now, before telling you about it, um, um, before actually telling you about quantum gravity, let me uh, make uh, let me spend, in fact, a bit of time, maybe ten minutes, uh, on uh, on some conceptual points, which I think uh, it's physicist needs a philosopher for uh, ideas, for inspiration, for clarity, for criticism, for uh, 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 telling him what he's doing wrong um, when uh, uh, looked uh, precisely what, what he's doing. A philosopher needs a physicist for telling him what we know about the world so far and what is the thing we're trying to do, what the science is doing uh, right now. Um, the data <coughs> is on. It's very strong, I believe, and people who say that the dialogue has been cut are just either blind or deaf, um, or more often sort of buying into one philosophy and thinking that's the right one and don't want to explain it to anybody else, or vice versa, buying into one physics and um, not wanting to listen to what is going on. Here, um, I think there is a conceptual point which I haven't seen discussed well in, uh, by the large literature uh, in, uh, in the philosophy of space and time, the philosophy of uh, the physics about space and time, uh, which is what we actually mean by space and time. I think there is a lot of confusion, and I want to get at the end of this list of questions that I mentioned at the beginning, um, by first disentangling uh, 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 the meaning of these words, how we use them, and uh, uh, I'll talk more about space, but almost everything I say, say about space is, uh, goes through about time. Um, we, when we, when, when is it that we do that? We, we, do, we do that when we give for granted something, right? We give for granted that space is that thing that we're talking about. Uh, but space, uh, in the way we use the world, is not just that thing. It's complicated. And uh, I want to, uh, address this, and I will do it start here, a little bit historically uh, by showing. I want I, I want to try to argue with you that a lot of things that in Chris talk, in Jani talk also, uh, was sort of given for granted is far less from granted and far less controversial. And once you're going to look quantum gravity, that's exactly what you have to address. Okay, so let me do uh, a little bit of history. In that, and I'll do history because I'm, I'm Italian, so I, I need to do history. Finding my place into things. 
Uh, but I think it's going to be very clarifying to a little bit of history. And I'll do a history not chronologically. Um, I, I've lived it out of Italy enough to understand you don't have to force, force to start from the beginning of the time. Uh, so I'll start from the middle, and then I'll go forward, back and forward. So the middle is Newton. So I'm starting by reminding you something you know very, very well. Um, and then the question. So Newton has a very clear exposition about what he means by space. Right? In fact, it is in the Principia. Uh, it's all at, at the beginning of the Principia. It's articulated. It's a long discussion. And there is a clear... Uh, and in modern terms, what he means by space, uh, it's very clear, is a sort of entity. And I'm saying a sort of entity because it is a sort of entity. I mean, in his own words, so he doesn't have to accept his words. Uh, which can be described mathematically as the three-dimensional uh, space, which is a linear space uh, and has a structure, this is a metric structure, um, has a, a, a notion of, uh, of distance. So in modern terms, we'll say it's R3. So R3 and its connection point x, y, z. He used the Cartesian uh, coordinates, even if he disagreed with the current almost everything else about uh, space. And uh, the, the actual space is, is defined by this R3 and the, the notion of distance. Some, some, some people call this E3. Uh, finally, a distance is what? A distance is, is, is a number associated to any two points. Uh, let me give the distance from the origin of a certain point. As you all know, it is x squared plus y squared. So that's the Euclidean space um, in its uh, uh, algebraic representation. So next to the car that. And uh, uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, we are asked by Newton to uh, accept the idea that there is this thing there, and things move into it. So bodies, the earth, the moon, and whatever, are somewhere here and they move, they go around. Which means that generically between one and object and the other there is nothing. Right? So we are asked by Newton to Take the idea that space is out there, whether or not there are things. Yeah. Which in particular means that space can be empty. There is empty space. It's a meaningful, uh, a meaningful object. Something similar is going on with time. I'll be shorter when I talk about time. Time, which uh, is sort of a variable that goes in, a, in R. Uh, R is a metric R. Uh, 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 time changes from one moment to the other, even if nothing happens. Okay? Now, this is the notion of uh, space that is so clearly uh, given by Newton, and then uh, from this Newtonian space, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, is uh, is uh, Minkowski space with the distinction that you know, and then the descendant of that general relativistic space time. But this is also space time, and then the quantum gravitational uh, space time, whatever whatever it means. I'm going to tell you what it means. Oh, you know this. Now, the point I want to stress is that when Newton did that, it didn't happen that everybody says, oh yes, of course, uh, that's our intuition, thank you for putting it so clearly. Everybody started screaming and said, this doesn't make any sense. Meaning what? Meaning that this is not at all an intuitive, natural, elementary description of what space is. When there was this, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you went through this uh, debate, uh, Newton Leibniz or Clark uh, Leibniz. Leibniz wasn't a funny guy who was uh, defending a strange relation position about space. Leibniz was just defending what everybody had been th thinking about space for 2,000 years. So, what is space before Newton and outside this Newtonian definition? Is there something else? Yes, of course. Um, so let me go rapidly through it. Um, so let me start from uh, everyday's notion of space. Um, in fact, the word space itself uh, 
Please call us. Uh, is that right? Is what you mean here? It means space in the sense a, a, a part of ground. Uh, uh, space is what has to do with the where. Okay? The answer of the where is uh, where, where are we? We are in Black Genève. Okay? We are in this room. Um, what, what, do we, what are we talking about when we're talking about where are we? I'm in Paris, I'm near the Tour, Tour Eiffel. We're talking about what's next to us. Not where we are in, in something with there's nothing else around. We're talking about uh, the objects that surround us and who, what is the, the, the... We are near that lake. I am near the blackboard. That's the where I am in everybody paradise. And the space is the part of ground which characterized by the objects which are, which are there. So, uh, as soon as somebody, as soon as we have uh, uh, <coughs> records of formalization of that, that's what we get. Uh, Aristotle had a very clean definition of space. You, I think you all met the, the definition of space. Of so, the, 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 the location of an object, what's the location of an object? The location of an object for Aristotle is uh, the location of an object is the the, uh, the internal so precise the internal boundary in other terms of the object. that surround the object. So the, the location of A is the internal uh, boundary of the object that surrounds A. So to be precise for Aristotle, where am I? What is my space, my location, is my position in space? Is the air around me, the internal boundary of the air. Where is the air? Is the building. Where are the walls? Is the, the air outside. Where is that air inside the sphere of fire? Where is the sphere of fire inside the heavens of the moon? Okay. So in other words, the picture of the world is that there are things, things have or not the property of being next to one another. This is not attached to that, this is attached to that. Who is attached to who? The structure of who is attached to who is what we call space. And to move means going from being attached to something to being attached. This is all the way, right? So, all the, so when we go to, to the beginning of modern science, to the heart, is exactly the same. We're still there. The space is a property of things. There's a rest, the, the material thing is a rest extensa, has a property which is extension. There is no space without things. So that's the natural. Uh, natural including Aristotle and Descartes use of uh, uh, the uh, spatial uh, structure of the world. It's a relation between things, not a empty container, not a container where things are located. Um, that's the reason why Newton had to struggle horrendously and everybody jumped over Newton and said this is nonsense. And the reason he prevailed is not that he was convincing theoretically, is that he's Equations were working. That's the reason he, his predictions were correct. So he, he won empirically, not because uh, he had a good argument for uh, space. He had some arguments about the battle and everything else. Wallen uh, insisted. Oh, one, uh, uh, so I, I want to stress a couple of things. One is that uh, this implies that. Uh, um, when people refer to that, when people say there is a relational or relationalist, whatever, uh, space. Um, this morning there was a question from, from you, I think, you, you referred to it, for instance, Barber. Yeah, Barber. I mean, Aristotle, Descartes. I mean, there are more Leibniz, there are more relevant people than Barber who think so space is this way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I want to go stronger than that uh, and follow me on this. Even if you believe that these things exist, uh, 
uh, neutronal space, Minkowski space. Nevertheless, when you use spatial notions, you're still using relational notions because you're, think, you're saying that a certain thing is located in some way with respect to space. So there isn't an alternative between relational space and substantivalist space, space as an entity of space as a relation. Space as a relation is a way that we use to talk about space always, whether or not we have an object which is Newtonian space, Minkowski space, generativistic space, or whatever. Is that this point is clear? So it's not either I'm a relational space or I'm a substantivalist. I may be a substantivalist or not, but I'm always a relationalist about space. I'm always talking about space as the location of an object with respect to something else. Something else can be the other objects uh, sort of forming the world, or one particular very big object going everywhere, which is Newtonian space or Minkowski space. Okay? Um, last point before going to loop quantum gravity, which sort of goes into loop quantum gravity. Um, what is this object that has evolved historically? First of all, where did it come from? Did Newton really invented it? He didn't. In fact, he recognizes where it comes from. It comes from the car, from um, uh, the Mobius, which is actually before this one, of course. Um, Democritus or Leotipus, whatever, so ancient atomism is the first uh, hint of, the, uh, of this picture here. So uh, the ancient atom is, was, was the idea that this vacuum, the space, and atoms moving into it. And Democritus is, is particularly obscure about this space, right? For Democritus, this, uh, this is a known being. The atoms are the being, and the space is a known being. He says, it's a known being that actually nevertheless is. So it's a being that is, doesn't it exist, but it doesn't exist. Okay, so it's non-existent that exists. And of course, Aristotle had a, not a great difficulty of saying this that nonsense it doesn't, doesn't stay together, right? What's the point? The point is that the, 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 the sort of ontological status of this object here has always been uh, not very clear since, since the very beginning. In fact, it was immediately rejected by Aristotle by, 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 by everybody else. Uh, Newton had a lot of debate about that. Newton himself is, a, is, is, is he, he calls it the sensorium dei, right? The, the, set, the organs of sense of God, which I don't believe he knew what he meant. Uh, I don't think anybody ever understood what, what Newton meant of that. Anyway, however, in a sense, it becomes more and more clear as you go ahead. And in fact, it, it, become, it becomes pretty clear once you're down here. Because uh, the great intuition of Einstein discovered for general relativity is discovering what is this thing. This thing is a gravitational field. Okay. It's nothing else than a gravitational field. So in a sense, uh, Minkowski, that, that's Einstein. what is general relativity? General relativity is discovery that space-time is a gravitational field. Or a gravitational field is space-time. This has nothing to do with relation or something else. This object that Newton has introduced has added to the furniture of the world is identified with the gravitational field. Aha, uh -huh, that's what it was. Um, so Minkowski space is nothing else at, at the light of what we've learned later on as the gravitational field in a particular configuration in which is not, uh, is not moving. And Newton, Newtonian space, this thing here, is the gravitational field in a configuration where uh, it's not shaking, and where things move slowly with respect to one another, so we don't see the, the, the Lycon uh, structure. So at the light of GR, we sort of understand what it was, this thing. Newton was right with a bucket to say that, aha, we need something with respect to which acceleration is defined in order to understand why the water of the bucket does that. That's correct. But it's not some fixed background space, it's just the gravitational field. And what is a gravitational field is the same as, uh, it's another, it's a brother of the electromagnetic field. So is this thing invented by, by, by Faraday? Fields. There is a beautiful, and then I close this part because I'm going too long, there is a beautiful, beautiful quote by Maxwell, 
Uh, I can't resist because I just discovered it. Uh, he says Faraday. Faraday is a genius, right? Because it's the one from the painting field. Uh, Faraday saw a medium stuff where everybody else so we're seeing so just distance. You think for a while, after a while you start smiling if you know general relativity. Because what he meant is that um, in this vacuum, okay, between here and here, Faraday realized that it's not vacuum at all, it's there are the Faraday lines, it's stuff, right? This is the field. It's filling up everything. And the where here means where everybody saw just distance and nothing else, uh, there was also the there is also a field, and Faraday is the one who understood it. But Maxwell didn't know, of course. Uh, general relativity shows that space itself is a field. So the way here, <laughs> you can be ready to a much stronger way. Um, Faraday saw a medium and understood it as a field uh, where people saw distance. So this structure here uh, can be thrown it away and replace it with a field, with a gravitational field, uh, and you get the generativistic picture of the world. And do you lose space time? No, you lose this, uh, uh, you replace uh, this entity which is Newtonian space and Newtonian time, with a field, something much less uh, strange, much less uh, being and non-being at the same time, okay? Field lines crossing. And what about space, space relations? Well, space relations are the same as all. Relational space, things are, are located with respect to one another. So I can be located with respect to the gravitational field, a black hole is located with respect to an electromagnetic charge, things are located with respect to one another, as if. So we don't lose the notion, spatial notions, uh, or spatial temporal notion either, we just reinterpret the Newtonian field, uh, the, 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 the Newtonian space uh, as a field, and uh, 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 once we go the last step, we reinterpret this as a quantum field. Okay? A quantum field which doesn't have the structure anymore, if not in some limit, and we have a quantum field interacting with other quantum fields, no space in the sense of Newton, relational localization as usual, as for Aristotle, as for our ancestors, as for Descartes, as for Barbour. Uh, in a non very controversial manner at all. So, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna now uh, tell you about quantum gravity, I'm done with that. What I'm gonna tell you is that in loop quantum gravity, space as an entity is replaced by a complicated thing made by quanta interacting with one another, like the geomagnetic field is, is, is replaced by photons. Uh, spatial localization relation and temporal relation, I, I was very fast on that. Uh, just go back to what they were before Newtonian space-time, to what they were for Aristotle or for everybody else before Newton. What is time for Aristotle is a measure of movement. Right? So it, it's, it's a way you use to count something is happening. So not something is happening when nothing is, when nothing is happening. And in, in, in loop quantum gravity, time is just a measure. Any way you have to count something, the happening of the process. Um, Let's see. Uh, I just wanted to flash the 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 equations of the theory. Um, well, what what is that? Uh, Theory of, of electromagnetic. You have states, 
Hello, Peritos. Any of the dynamics? Uh, yeah, it's not really clear, but it's, uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a way of summarizing uh, sort of the evolution of, uh, of the ontology and fundamental uh, physics, which sort of shows what I said. In, in Descartes, it's just this rest extensa, there's no space as, a, as, as an entity. And then Newton, uh, thank you, replaced matter with bodies that are located in space. I was quickly talking about time here to be more precise. Then uh, um, uh, Faraday acts the field. Uh, I had one somewhere. Yeah, I have one. Oh, fantastic. So um, Faraday acts the field. Einstein in uh, 1905 combines space and time in, in, in space time. Special uh, relativity, uh, sorry, quantum mechanics shows that the field of particles are a manifestation of the same thing, right? The electron is a manifestation of the Dirac field, and the, a photon is a manifestation of the magnetic field. And then, that's a key point, general relativity combines uh, the realization of space time as a field like the field. So you have just a, a field not leading on a manifold, but sort of a field leading on one another. Electromagnetic field leaning and gravitational field, and vice versa. And then when you try to bring everything together, you go back to a single stuff, like the resistance of the car, so to say, which are quantum fields not leaning on a manifold, but leaning on top of, 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 uh, of one another. And uh, what I really wanted to flash is this transparency here, not because I'm going to describe the mathematics, but because I want to say that uh, this is looking to work in a in, uh, in few lines. I just want to tell you that there's nothing mysterious, nothing complicated, nothing. Uh, it's just a, a few lines, and I, 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 I don't go into defining this mathematical quantity, but I do want to tell you what, what are they uh, in work, uh, very roughly, by uh, bringing the analogy with the theory that we know well, like quantum electromagnetism. So in quantum electromagnetism, we have states. Uh, so in a Hilbert space, there's a Hilbert space there, uh, and in this Hilbert space you can write a basis which describe the quantum states of electromagnetism, there are different bases, a convenient basis, the photons. Right, so the, the photon states, you give the position of the momentum or the photons. You have uh, uh, n photon, that's a state with n photons and new particles, and you give the position or the momentum of each one of them, that's a state. And the list of all this, uh, the list of all this is, 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 a, uh, is, a, is a basis, the Hilbert space, or if you want a Fox space, it's a Hilbert space with that particular structure. That's one basis. You have a field basis, the other basis. What you do with the state is nothing. The quantum mechanics, you have the Hilbert space, you don't do nothing, you don't do anything. You have the operators, so the automatics, you have, for instance, the field operator, the creation and annihilation operators, A of K, the dagger of K, which represent what? They represent um, how the fields interact with you or with anything else. So the way the field manifests itself in any interaction. So in quantum mechanics, you're always doing a system interacting with another system, which is traditionally called the observer, very bad notation because very bad terminology because observer you immediately mean somebody with glasses and looking at it. So it could be any other system which you, the first system interacted with. This interaction is described as operators. So for instance, out of this operator you can write the energy, you say something being affected by the energy is being affected by uh, by the value of the energy, the value of the energy is always an eigenstate of the energy, you compute the eigenspectrum of the energy, you find it discrete, and you find that photons have given E is H2, and so on. That's quantum mechanics. And then, of course, you need some dynamics, um, how these states evolve with time. So if you're doing QED, um, you give final rules, for instance, which tells you how an electron speed, uh, sorry, how a photon sp splits in the electron and anti-electron with a certain amplitude, or whatever, whatever it is. So that's all. That's quantum physics. 
list of states, set of operators, how they act on the Hilbert space, and then how this evolves. And that's how loop quantum gravity is given. There is a state space, which is written there. Um, there is a definition of operators. And there aren't, uh, it's sort of similar to the, uh, to the photons. You see, you, you, you have quanta. Instead of quanta of electromagnetic field, you have quanta of gravity, sort of chunks of, of gravitational field. And since a gravitational field, remember, is, 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 a great, is generating a space now, which is a Minkowski space, which is Newtonian space, is chunk of space, atoms of space, which are quantized. If you do the eigenvalue of uh, spectral analysis of the operator that describe how big they are, you find that they are quantized, like the, like the photons, so the volume of the individual quantum space are, uh, have levels, like the energy levels of, a, of an atom. The big difference is that this quantum number here, the momentum, if you forget, transform is a position. What is it? It's a position of the photon with respect to space. There, there's no corresponding quantum number because there's no space. The quantum numbers are the size of these things and these links who says who is attached to who. So the quantum space are only located with respect to one another. They are not located with respect to something else. The solution of Einstein equation is not located with respect to something else. It's only located, it defines location. The solution of Maxwell equation is located in Minkowski space. Okay? So if you take a solution of Einstein, of Maxwell equation, you move, you have a different solution. If you take a solution of Einstein equation, you move, you have the same solution. So you're not moving with respect to anything. Okay? So here, you have a, a, a bunch of states which are sort of imagine a discrete space which doesn't live in space, it's space itself. It's a discrete version of space itself. It's a basis. You have a set of operators out of which you describe everything you can measure or interact with the, with the gravitational field, in particular distance, area, volume, all these things here, the functions of uh, GVNU, the matrix of the gravitational field, and then there's transition amplitudes which tell you how one of these states evolves into one of these states, and this is given by a certain formula, which uh, is not even too complicated. These are just uh, bigger matrices, so well-known things in representation theory. And that's it. That's the thing. So, <clears throat> what do we do with that theory, uh, and what do we describe? Well, we describe uh, space-time, quantum gravitational field, how it interacts with anything else and how it affects anything else when we are interacting <laughs> with it. Okay? And uh, how uh, between one interaction and another evolves with time through that transition amplitude there. That's the theory. Is there a space-time where these things are defined? No, these things are themselves uh, space-time. Is there um, um, a way to relate this to classical generativity? Of course, it's exactly the same in which this structure is related to classical electromagnetism. Classical electromagnetism is a field, continuous field, um, which certain states approximate very well. So it, it's perfectly under control the way in which photon states, in some limit, when you look at them from a, from a, a resolution which is large compared to h bar, behave like a classical field. It's a smooth thing which describes approximately a discrete thing. Okay? My t-shirt is a smooth thing which is actually discrete when I look at the small. So the smooth description of my t-shirt is not fundamental. It's an approximate description of the discreteness of my t-shirt. We use that in condensed matter. I mean, we describe this as smooth. It's an approximate description to its atomic structure. The electromagnetic field is an approximate description of something which is discrete into small. Newtonian space uh, and classical generativistic space is a smooth approximate description of those states which are discrete into small. So there's nothing magic in the emergence. There's no need of thermodynamical limit. There's no need of what behind the, the gravitational field. I mean, uh, 
strange, there should be something else that it appears as a, as a, no, it's just a standard classical, quantum to classical transition. Quantum to classical transition has been studied in all possible ways. Of course, there are mathematical nicety, and you know, take the limit, a mathematician can work uh, on that for, for very long. But the way the classical space time, so generativistic continuous curved space time, emerged from that structure is not mysterious. It emerged from that structure in the formal limit in which h bar is going to zero. Namely, when you look at it at scale very large compared to the Planck scale, and it's a standard quantum to classical transition. I insist on that because there's a lot of literature saying a lot of blah 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 about the mystery of the emergence of space time. There's no mystery for emergence of space time. There is just a standard case in which quantum theory goes to the classical theory. How do we think about space time in the fundamental theory itself? Because after all, this was a key question that Chris posed this morning. How to ask questions about that theory if we don't have a localization? Okay. Team modeling would stream. Oh, there is no space. It's not that. Oh, we don't need space. Okay. Aristotle didn't need space. And he was very comfortable with this. Descartes didn't need space independent from matter. Why? Because, of course, you use local observable and you describe local observable. Well, local means localized localization of things with respect to one another. I'm here near to this thing here. Okay? I make measurements which are not global all over the universe in spite of the fact that I'm localized only with respect to the gravitational field, the electromagnetic field, the electric fields around, around me. So when I have one of those states, okay, I know where things are with respect to the graph itself, with respect to the quantum state itself. I don't need to localize the quantum state itself with respect to something else. I only need to localize things one with respect to the other. Okay? So relational localization is there whether or not you have something which you call gravitational field or quantum gravitational field or quantum space-time, it doesn't matter, it's a matter of name. And uh, local observable still makes sense. Um, and they are relational. They are relational because localization is always relational in any case. Okay. Um, last point. I have last uh, ten minutes, so um, I think I'm going to keep that and erase. Erase this. Uh, this was point number four in my list, mission list. Excellent. I want to do this because um, uh, it makes this concrete and uh, because uh, it's uh, what I've been doing last year with my group in Marseille and with people in, uh, um, uh, in Grenoble, in uh, the Netherlands uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and because uh, it's a possibility, a hope for testing, for testing this theory concretely. So you see how it, uh, it, uh, it completely works out. And um, here it is. Uh, that's the story. Um, when we do quantum mechanics, let me put it this way. Quantum gravity inherits the strangeness of general relativity. There's no fixed background space-time general relativity, so there's no fixed background space-time quantum gravity, and inherits the strangeness of quantum theory. Quantum theory is strange by itself, you all know. Quantum gravity is not less strange than quantum mechanics. It's at least equally strange, if not more. So every time you find a strangeness in quantum gravity, ask yourself, I mean, it's just the strangeness of generativity, it's just a strangeness of quantum mechanics or something else. Right? And very often people are uh, flabbergasted by quantum gravity, but it's just quantum mechanics. Nothing to do with quantum gravity itself. So let me take quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics can be read in all possible ways. I'm sure that we'll disagree how to read quantum mechanics. So let me take the traditional way of looking at quantum mechanics, a simple one. 
I have a quantum, what I just erased here. I have a quantum system here and interact with some other piece of the world here, which I happen to call observable in that case, and I have a sequence of measurement. And quantum mechanics tell me everything, all the possible ways in which this affects this and give probabilistic predictions about, about it. Okay? Quantum gravity, we're going to do the same. We're not going to solve the problem of quantum mechanics by doing quantum gravity. Okay? So let's use this scheme and try to, do, to apply it in a quantum gravitational situation. This is a quantum gravitational situation of Epstein. You have the black holes in the universe. Plenty of black holes in In fact, the, <coughs> perhaps the most striking discovery of the last decade is that there are zillions, truly, really black holes in the universe of all scales, which we didn't expect. The one seen by LIGO, what is it, last week? Last month, the second one, are much bigger than a solar mass, and nobody expected so big, and the previous one also. So it's, the universe is plenty of collapses. So question, what happened to this collapse thing on the long run? Classical generativity predicts they're forever, they're stable, but nothing is forever in the world. Um, quantum field theory on curved space-time, which what Chris described this morning, um, predicts in a way that theoretical physicists surprisingly you know, agree <laughs> into considering incredible that uh, they shrink, black holes shrink, evaporate, hot, emit radiation, and then nobody knows what happened. Uh, we need quantum gravity to see what happened. So you take quantum gravity and you try to see what happened. And what do you do? Well, you do this. This is your black hole. This is your external universe. And you try to describe what happened there from the external universe. So use your preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics, take Copenhagen, just to be, okay? You're, you're outside, okay? And that's your experiment. Matter collapse, and you want to see what, come, what the probability distribution of what comes out, okay? You do that, and you discover that there is a very distinct possibility that quantum gravity allows that the, the, the black hole collapse, and after a while, it explodes. How can it explode? By violating the Einstein equations, by violating classical physics, exactly the same way in which an atom, uranium atom, decays after some time, tunneling. Right? If, you, if you take a particle, you put it in a box, a classical particle is there forever, a particle comes out after some time that you can compute this time. So that's what we did. We take matter, it collapses into its own horizon, you wait enough, and then there is a tunneling process that comes out. Okay? And the reason we're excited is that uh, it takes long, but not too long. So if the black hole is small enough, if it forms in the, this, this picture is an expanding universe. Okay? The universe becomes full of galaxies, becoming larger and larger. So if near the Big Bang, near the Big Bang there's a lot of heat and mess and uh, agitation. So uh, as cosmologists believe that black hole form there. If a sufficiently small black hole form there, um, it collapses, it waits for a finite time, and then it may explode. And if it explodes, uh, it may emit signals, essentially it emits what was inside, all that's shaken, and we might see it. So we use loop quantum gravity, I'll tell you in a moment how, to compute um, the mass, the, 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 the time of explosion as a function of the mass. So given the time here, which is the Hubble time, we can compute the mass. From the mass, we know the size of the exploding black hole, and we can estimate the wavelength of the signal. And it turns out to be the millimeters, and uh, it turns out that astronomers are seeing signals, uh, which nobody knows what it is. They're called fast radio burst in the millimeter. So here's an hypothesis. Well, take it with a lot of grains of salt. So, made, yeah, this all. Um, it is possible, far from proven, uh, but it is possible that these things which are already observed could be exploding black holes which are tunneling quantum gravitation out. So there's a genuine quantum gravity phenomenon uh, that uh, we might have already observed. Uh, when the statistics of this observation will be enough, there will be a way to distinguish this, this uh, interpretation from others, so we'll see whether this is right or, or, or not. How do we do this calculation? Here's how we do the calculation. 
That's a picture of space-time. Uh, that's the collapsing matter. That's the outcoming matter. Outside is just a Schwarzschild because you're outside the black hole. Inside there something which we took a shell to collapse, it happened to be Vygotsky. The point is that there is a quantum region, let me call it region in quote, where the Einstein equations are violated. So that's where quantum gravity is needed. Okay? When you do a quantum, quantum mechanic experiment, you have a preparation in your lab, something funny happens, and you see the probability of what comes out. So here's the same. You have space-time coming in, space-time and matter coming in, something in between. In between, there's no trajectory, no space, no time, no nothing. You only have probability amplitude. You use equations that I flashed in the previous thing, and you compute the probability amplitude of what comes out, which in particular gives you when the thing is going to come out. So, no space and no time inside. Localization is, is, is with respect to your, the thing with which you are interacting, which here is just simply the outside space-time. A quantum calculation for a region where there is no space, no time. And a result, which is uh, uh, the lifetime of a black hole, which in principle has an astrophysical interpretation and can be used or not to interpret uh, this series. So this is interesting because this might be, we might have seen really exploding black hole, that would be great. But even if we haven't, the reason I'm presenting it here, it shows that you can just use quantum gravity. You can use a theory where there's no space, no time. Um, you know what are your observable. You know what are your states. You know what are your dynamics. Uh, you use standard Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, because that's the quantum theory we have until we get a better version of quantum theory. So you can do that in the Bowie in the Bowie bomb. It's just horrendous and more complicated. But you can also do it in um, so you have the strangeness of quantum mechanics. You have the strangeness of general relativity, which is the absence of a background space over which things evolve. There's, there's no evolution over something in this region in between the quantum region. There's no space, no time, in a sense. Between. Like it for Heisenberg, there is no trajectory of the electron between two measurements, exactly in the same sense. One of the questions this morning was, why do we expect that uh, quantum gravity, there is no space, no time? For the same reason for which we don't, quantum mechanics, we don't expect trajectory uh, to exist. Nevertheless, uh, the theory is predictive, uh, and uh, it's obviously empirically coherent here. I'm telling you specifically, look in the sky and you'll see that signals. I mean, I'd be wrong in that particular case, but you see how, how the thing, uh, the thing works. So let me wrap up and summarize. Uh, space as an entity, in the Newtonian sense, in the generativistic sense, has disappeared entirely from the fundamental theory. It is replaced by a quantum field theory of quanta of space interacting one another, which or, or quanta of gravity interacting one another. You might want to call it space or not. It's just games. Okay. So you may space well. You might be a, a fundamentalist, uh, um, substantivalist, and say, yeah, sure, that space is still there. We're talking about it. All right. So you call it space. Or you might say, uh, oh no, no, no. This has nothing to do with Newtonian space because it's not continuous, it's not a manifold, it's not, uh, so there's no space anymore, fine, it's just a name. That's what there is. There is a quantum state of, of, of gravity. The theory predicts how this interact with, uh, uh, with uh, anything else. There's no time along which the interaction happens. The time is related to the observed, uh, the last classical generativity is, is, uh, is, is, is one of the observable quantities outside. Okay, so the simplest way of imagining it is that the clock at some distance and see how, how, how much the clock will measure from here to there. Um, uh, there is no localization with respect to a preferred entity. There is localization with respect to things to one another that's sufficient for uh, clarity on uh, what is being measured uh, and, what, and how to interpret the predictions of the theory. I think I'll stop here and I take questions.
there would be no space time in this, and I'm not sure if you meant by this, loop on gravity or what was going on in this last bit of black holes. There's no space time in this, just like there's no space time in quantum mechanics, because there are no determinate future factors. Uh, I meant in the... Can you say more about that? Because usually in quantum, and in just non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you're thinking, well, no, there, there are locations, it's just indeterminate where the thing is. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, what I said is this, uh, there is no space-time in the manifold sense in, in loop quantum gravity. There is no space-time in that quantum region there, which is a concrete application of loop quantum gravity in the specific case. Um, not like there is no space-time in quantum mechanics, like there is no trajectory of an electron. Oh, okay. 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 So one typical way of presenting quantum mechanics, which can be challenged that also, I mean, it's a radical moment of challenging, is that, but typical way of presenting quantum mechanics, it says, look, the electrons don't have a trajectory, they, they go through both holes of the, of the, of, of the two holes. to see that's kind of, uh, they open up in, uh, in clouds. Yes, so, so I'm just curious about the, the time order in terms of these first you see on, in uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and then your prediction, whether you made the prediction and then became aware of these first or the. Oh, so the yeah, so, oh, so no. this, 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 this. We became aware later. In fact, the way it happened is that um, we, we had a first guess about the timing of that. Which is that the, the, the bouncing time is, is, is proportional to the cube of the mass. Um, then we looked at that uh, uh, and uh, we discovered that uh, uh, we didn't believe that anymore. The, the, the time is proportional to the square of the mass. So this is point two, basically. Uh, at that point, uh, we didn't expect at all that there would be any connection with. Uh, with observation. In fact, all this was done without even thinking of natural observation. And then uh, um, one of my collaborators kept saying, well, we should compute this. Uh, what would be the signal of a primordial black hole? We should we do it from n and q and square? And we say, oh, come on. So finally, we did this calculation, and we came out with uh, uh, centimeters, wavelength of centimeters. And then we said, all right, so we're not going to see signals, strong signals in the sky in the and shortly after, somebody, we were talking about that, somebody said, but you know that the faster the universe. We didn't know the faster And the faster universe, in fact, are not in the centimeters, are millimeters. There, there is a couple, couple of order of magnitude, there's more. But to the level of this precision, it could still be compatible. Fast universe have other empty explanations. There might be something else. Uh, there might be that there are no problems. We're not certain about the problems. Uh, but now it became very exciting. At this point, we became very excited because we had this prediction of someone said, look, they are, they are seeing this thing from the sky. So we were very excited. And then um, an astrophysicist from, uh, from Grenoble um, understood that if, if, if the past universe has this origin, they will have a very specific dependence of frequency from distance that could be checked once there's enough statistics. So there is a sort of smoking gun uh, that could say within a few years with enough statistics if this is the right, if this is the credible explanation of the format. So we're waiting. I, I'm secretly optimistic, but you know, uh, it might very well be that, I don't know, I will give it 30% and <laughs> 4 and, uh, and 70 against. I just wanted to ask about the classical limit quantum gravity. You mentioned it's just a case of taking um, h to zero like any other quantum theory, but I, I can, from the equations you had on the slide, I can see exactly how that would go. It's, it's far from, uh, from transparent. Um, and uh, if one wants to do something precise, it's still missing. Something all the way to the is still missing, but people are still disputing this. The, the point is that uh, is double. Um, you, want, you want to do two things. F from the states, you want to reconstruct states that look like three-dimensional geometries. 
And that's well under control. So this silver space here now has been studied and there are hundreds of people about this silver space here. Um, you can write a state in this silver space, which is a clearing state, it's a classical state. And uh, uh, you, with, from the operator you, you, you construct a three metric and uh, you see that uh, what the thing describes is just a, a smooth three geometry when seeing at a large scale. But the question is the dynamics. I mean, do we see the Einstein equation? And then you have to go to this transition amplitudes. And uh, in fact, these transition amplitudes, uh, it's a beautiful uh, theorem proved by um, a group in England, Barrett, uh, and his, uh, his collaborators, uh, John Barrett in Nottingham. Uh, he was able to show that if you have uh, a three-dimensional geometry um, sort of around the region, um, this amplitude, uh, in the limit in which the geometry is large compared to, to the Planck scale, goes to the exponential of the einstein event action, which is the proper way in which you um, so, uh, the, the propagator in, in, in quantum mechanics, so x uh, e to the i h, uh, uh, let's not write h, uh, i uh, uh, t uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, this x y t, this is equal for h, for small h bar, uh, e to the i, the uh, Hamilton function, x, y, t, the, the action. The action computed on the trajectory from x to y in a time t. Okay? Uh, this is a way of writing the classical limit. If this is true, then uh, this Hamiltonian here would give the same dynamics of this uh, action here. And this is true. So this is spectacular, in a sense, because, oh, look, uh, the Einstein equation here. Why is not complete? Because this is true sort of first order. You take one vertex of the theory, and you see that this is true. So the theory knows about the Einstein equations. The question is, when you go to higher order, you have many vertices, is this going to survive? And that's what people are debating. So that's the strongest indication that the classical limit of, well, it's not surprising, I mean, this was built in order for the classical limit to be the Einstein equations. Uh, but you don't see the Einstein equation there. I mean, this is just a very simple group theoretical expression, and the Einstein equation there. It's like, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, the Feynman graph, uh, the Feynman vertex, which is E uh, gamma, what is it, um, mu AB, A, B, mu, contains the maximum equation, the entirely written here. Okay, so something similar. <coughs> From QD, QD, the, the entire dynamics of QD is written here. So the maximum and the right equation are written here in some sense. In some sense also in those vertex there, the, all the coupling of the Einstein equations. So they are there. Um, uh, the question is that they're really there once I refine, uh, I go to high order perturbation theory, if you want to refine, I refine my approximation. That has been debated. So, just to plug our, our YouTube channel for a bit. So, Francesco Verdotto came and gave a, a talk which was about it's more or less this kind of issue in, in Geneva that's such an online. I'm not sure if you mentioned what she said. So we had this similar kind of the same kind of discussion about exactly what you said it, it was really helpful. Um, so here's what this is actually not from her, but from another visitor we had and talked about uh, talked with this. So the result we're talking about. So you talked about. So you said you sort of you get something like the Einstein field equation at a, at a kind of at a node. The way I had it put before was that, that you can sort of show that it works for a single, so you sort of think about the a simplicity, you know, yeah. mapping out the space with the simplicity. It is the same thing. So it's a single language. simplex that you can do this for. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So you want to go to a, like multiple simplices, so you're looking at nodes that are kind of connected in every possible dimension. So it's kind of like, 
that sounds something like the Einstein field equations kind of are, are occurring on the edge of this little chunk of space or something. You really want? To yeah, I mean, well, Einstein field equations. That kind of way of thinking about. Yeah. That's what you mean by what sort of, what people are arguing about at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Exactly. Einstein field equations, like Max equations, are local. They just say what happens in a small. <clears throat> if they're true in a little teeny piece of space time everywhere, then they're true global because they're local equations, they're not global equations. Um, so that's why one starts to look at the, sure. the small, you know, it's differential equation, it tells what happened in a little in a little region. But you from that to actually the differential true. equation you'd like to know that it held a, <coughs> sort of a, a point in the middle of the little region, not at the edge of the little region, not just at the edge of the little region. Yeah, except that there's no point in the middle of the region. That's that's the entire story. There's, there's, it's not, it's, the, the picture, <coughs> uh, what Nick is saying is that the, uh, this figure here is like the vertex in a, in a Feynman diagram. You have, you have an incoming quantum of space splitting into three, and you're giving an amplitude of that. And then a, a, a complicated process, you can represent it with many of them attached to one another. If you want a high order process, uh, you represent to many of them uh, attached to one another. And there's a dual way of viewing of that. This is, a, this is like a chunk of space time, and a complicated process is the discretization of space time, is more chunks. So the more chunks, the more, the more you take your space time, you break into many chunks, and you do this, the better approximation you. Have. So, so there's this dual. It's not bigger, it's more fine grain. Sorry? It's not bigger, it's just more fine grain. Yes, that's right. It's, okay. it's more fine grain. Yes, that's right. Um, but it's like, in, it's like in, in, in QD, right? It's not. Uh, I would say. An electron is not a little thing that turns. A quantum of space is not really a piece of space uh, with a geometry. It's, 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 it's something, it's a quantum object whose classical limit, when you disregard things, can be described that way. Um, so what I'm saying is that there are no other degrees of freedom uh, smaller than that at that level of approximation. So, so don't take too seriously the geometrical picture of tetraedra and four simplices. It's very useful, extremely useful, but shouldn't be taken literally. And this is a very simple question. I'm confused how should I interpret that network. So each point of the network is what? And that, that's the first question. Depends on the answer. What's like each point that that network? Um, if I, <coughs> uh, you mean physically or mathematically? The yeah, physical, what? The, you, what is the physical picture corresponding to? Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to represent at that point within the whole. Yeah. So um, I, I I wrote here the uh, a, a, a a fox bit. It's K one K n. Uh, the, the physical picture of that is you have n photons which have momentum respectively k1 and k n. So you think of fo n photons. So there, um, which means what? It means that if you measure the, 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 the particle number uh, n, you get n. Particle number is a certain field of expression. And uh, if you measure the momentum, uh, uh, you get, you get thus those things appropriately and, and so on and so forth. So here you can do the same thing. You can take one of those states, one of these uh, uh, network with uh, have quantum numbers over there, and measure things. In the sense, you have operators, this operator interpreted, it and you see what they describe. And what they describe is a region of space, which you can take a form by pieces of space, each piece being one of those nodes, and the line tells you which piece is next to which. And the quantum numbers tell you the shape, the geometrical shape, the size, the volume, the area of the region of the region. This comes out from the from 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 the rings themselves. So and the, the discrete idea that this is discrete 
do not depend on discrete with respect to what? Like, discrete is not the is not the discrete of the graph because the discrete of the graph is like the um, let's go back here. The discrete um, good question. Um, suppose I do a a quantum field, uh, say scalar in a box. Okay. Uh, so this is my x direction, and my field is phi of x. Okay. Then I'm told to do two things. First thing is uh, let's expand this in Fourier modes. So let me write this as a sum, sum over some Fourier modes k. K is discrete. One, two, three. Of some coefficients phi k and some I don't know. Cosine of uh, k x uh, with some two pi, whatever is. Here we see a discreteness. This has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, right? This is just a an expansion in modes. Each one of these modes, say the, the fundamental one, this one, for instance, or, or the first one, if I do its quantum mechanics, its energy is quantized. That's the quantum discreteness. Okay. So let's go back here. Uh, this discreteness in the sense of a chance is not a discreteness. I can always take a, 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 a continuous uh, 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 geometry and approximate arbitrarily as I want to see the chance to the expansion, the analogous to the expansion of a rigid triangulation of the point. The point is that if you look at the quantum mechanics, each one of this is a channel space, if you look at the volume that it can take, the volume is discrete and it has meaning. So in other words, the thing is telling me that there is no state which is a, a, an approximation finer than the quantum scale per line. So, the, 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 the discreteness is the discreteness of the uh, geometrical uh, quantity in these states here. And uh, the computed explicitness is, is, is not, a, is not a, a, a complicated calculation. It's, uh, for instance, the area of each one of the individual surfaces is h bar g, and then there is some 8 pi and the step, the square root, of j n j as we do the simple thing j plus one so the standard SU two representation theory that plays that so j is a, is a half integer j is zero one half one etc so the area can only take uh, levels like the harmonic oscillator which means that if I have the surface of this its area cannot be too small. I cannot if I want to, I cannot represent it better by making more individual, by going to a finer triangulation of smaller things. It's connected to your special question. So the spin networks are networks of space-time charts. Yes. And space-time charts are not fundamental in the theory of law. Are not? Fundamental in the theory of blue point gravity. They're definable from quantum state operators. Yeah. But space-time space charts themselves are not part of the line of ontology. Tell me your question again. Space-time charts are not part of the line of ontology. Space-time charts are not part of the line of ontology. Are photons fundamental in quantum electromagnetism? Play it the way you want. In, in electromagnetism, in the Hilbert space, okay, all the space are the same. So not much structure in the space. And then you have the operator A of K, uh, k vector, the dagger of k. Okay. Um, out of this, you can you can construct the, the Hamiltonian, and then you can write a basis here, which happens to diagonalize the quantum number, the energy, and so forth, which is the photon basis. The one, this, this one here. What this is physically. Uh, if I interact with an electromagnetic field, the way it affects me, if I measure the energy, I have this energy levels, this discrete energy levels. For, if I look at the energy for a given uh, wavelength, I only see this, uh, this energy levels. That we, 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 we say we understand. Now, you want to say that the photons are the fundamental ontology, or you want to say that the fundamental ontology is the space of the operators, 
Whatever answer you give here in the middle, say. What, what I'm saying is that do not confuse the strangeness of quantum gravity with the strangeness of quantum mechanics. So I can talk that. If you want to say um, QD is about electrons and photons, like final, then LQG is about spin electrons. So you pick a basis and you say, I want to consider that my approach. Fine. If you're happy, fine. But then you have to remember that the part of the position, there's interference, there's also the findings. So even if the, uh, the space time bits in this spin network aren't fundamental, uh, it still seems like we said they could have, they could have different areas. So, so it seems like these bits of space-time can have intrinsic properties of their own, which seems, that, that seems like something that any relationist would balk at. Under uh, this definition of relations, but not relations, I think that you have not relations. Well, if, like, like one, one typical motivation for relationism about space is, um, well, is that there's, there's nothing to distinguish one bit of space from another. space from another. But if some of these bits of space are bigger than others, Then it seems like uh, there's more than size, and there's how they are located in the network. Also, <coughs> the distinguished one. Right, but that that's relationally fine. Uh, but the fact that there are objective divisions of space time into these bits with different sizes. Makes space more more like matter than any than many relations. I'm not committed to radical fundamentals. That's what the theory. That's a theory that. That's what I'm saying. That's a theory that. I think up to you know, complete list of things. It's a quantum theory, it's classical genetic in some limits, and it's a possible quantum theory of gravity. It's possible what? Quantum theory of gravity. Okay. Then uh, how to read it uh, in terms of what kind of answer it is to please that's open to me. It's not it's not born to be committed to one particular uh, attitude toward what is space time. Right. I, I guess I'm just what I'm what I'm suggesting here is that um, the go moving to loop quantum gravity. It's not as simple as like going back to previous oh. relations. Well, yeah, um, I wasn't like saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Within this story, uh, you don't talk about absolute localization, you talk about relative localization. But one of the ingredients of the world, I mean, there's a Dirac field, there's a electromagnetic field, the field fields, and the gravitational field. The gravitational field is considered one of the ingredients of the furniture. So if and it has its own features, very peculiar and very specific. Uh, so this all gives you the possibility if you want to say, oh, Ben is a substance timeless theory because that's my space time. Oh, and you can say, so you can say instead that these, uh, well, I, this is a question. Can, can you say that these, the nodes in these spin networks are not, not bits of space time, but just bits of the gravitational field? What's 
And the entire discord of what I said is this doesn't make sense to make this document. Oh, well. So at some point you're saying that uh, it's like asking, was this thing needed by the heart or by the Cartesian? <laughs> Say that. Yeah, but if you, if you put it in the gravitational field language, well then you can talk about um, all these different fields, not not living in one space time, but all living Don't on top of each other. Uh, but when you call one of them space time, it sounds like like that's that that one is the scene on which all the other ones. Uh, I don't think this second, this last step that you mentioned, is, is, is nothing in the theory that forces us to take this step. I think that, uh, especially in the quantum theory, it's, uh, I don't see anything that distinguishes this field uh, so dramatically from the others. Uh, each field is different in some sense. It seems to me that what the physics is saying is, look, they're just a bunch of fields. Um, you know, uh, is this piece of material here on which we're walking very special in the universe? No, it's just one stone and the other one happened to be. So we took it as a reference for localization with the Earth uh, for, for, for very long, uh, not because by itself it's particularly uh, different than anything else. For us, it's the simplest way of localizing. Yeah, also. And so that's what you have said. It's, look, there's something with respect to which you can localize yourself, and we realize it's just a few like the other. So this is a similar direction. I think I understand the spirit of your interpretation that there's one field on top of all the gravitational fields, just like one of the other fields that were one on top of each other, and not on a metaphor. But I have a hard time understanding the letter of that because uh, the metric field is defined on a manifold. I don't know what it would mean as a mathematical object anyway, not to have a manifold on which you define these fields. So how should I help me help me reconcile the spirit of crazy with the letter? Um. Let me give you two answers, one physical and one mathematical. The physical one is that uh, 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 Maxwell reformulated the Feynman notion, uh, Feynman, uh, Faraday notion of a field uh, in terms of uh, uh, electromagnetic fields uh, as uh, functions on a point. Um, but even for Maxwell, that was just the way of talking about the Faraday lines. So in, in each point, you put a, a, an electric field, say, which points in the direction where the actual Faraday line is going there, and uh, its strength, its length, is uh, what the density of the Faraday line goes <coughs> to there. So already for Maxwell, the field description was not to be thought as a property of space there, but as a description of some actual stuff uh, medium um, that Faraday had introduced as a real entity, autonomous entity in physics. Faraday in his book, The, the, the Research on Electricity, uh, toward the end has a beautiful discussion about are these lines real? Um, he goes back and forth about uh, are they real? It's a, a fantastic line. He says, um, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have got into that uh, um, unless uh, um, I thought this is important uh, because it goes to the very death of science, but I say that with hesitation as it requires to go <laughs> in this major. So, it's, it's, um, so for Faraday, the field, uh, it's, a, it's an entity uh, which he visualized with this actual lines. Like it was a, and for Maxwell, uh, sorry, for Einstein, Einstein went back and forth ten times for that. But at the end of the line, his life, in the in the fifth appendix of the of his uh, popular book, he, he goes back to the notion of fields, discuss it, and he has this molluscus, uh, the jellyfish metaphor, and he says uh, the the field should not be thought 
as uh, a decoration of a manifold. The field is an entity by itself. Um, we can have mathematical descriptions of it uh, by saying, by this sort of round, roundabout procedure, which say, let's define a manifold, let's define the field of the manifold, but let's then um, divide, in modern terms, divide by the homomorphism group. So what we actually consider is equivalence classes of fields on the manifold up to diffeomorphism. So what you're doing, I'm going to mathematics now, what I'm do doing in mathematics is first set up the manifold and then divide by the, <laughs> by the manifold, in a sense, you're getting rid of it. What remains is not localization of the manifold, but is relative localization. So uh, I think it's a matter of language. Uh, the, the manifold picture is misleading and it comes from the old, uh, from, from the Newtonian picture. Right? It comes from Newton. Newton told us, oh, look, put your manifold, have things here. So we have kept things this way. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that general activity has gone away from that, explicitly gone away from that. Whether you use metric or tetra, it doesn't matter. It's the same, it's the same story. So when you define the, 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 the space of solution of Einstein equation as the space of, sorry, when, when you define the possible physical gravitational field that the space of solution of Einstein equation modulo diffeomorphism, you're exactly saying um, the manifold doesn't count. And you know, John Ehrman and, and, and John Norton were very clear in that. I think they were totally right. But then at the level of the spin networks, you have the analogous move where you first introduce a spin network exactly. on a, a manifold, exactly. on the manifold. Exactly. And then you, you say, but now exactly. I'm, I'm, uh, exactly. you know, I'm introducing this, uh, the symmetries which are physically relevant, exactly. characterize the, 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 the object physically in the correct way. I have to actually take a look at an equivalence class, exactly. all possible embeddings of that otherwise exactly. uh, identical spin network. And in that sense, even though the manifold is there, the mathematical descriptions, uh, that shows it's not, it's not, it doesn't correspond to a physical exactly. Sort of background. Exactly so. And, and the, the quantum theory makes this more clear because an equivalence class of matrix up to the force is, is, is a hard notion to digest. Uh, but the spin network, independently of its embedding, as a, you know, as a graph, graph as an abstract thing decorated with, uh, with quantum numbers, is a totally clear object uh, intuitively. And its physical interpretation is totally clear. It's not somewhere. It's aware with respect to which you can locate something else. And in fact, in, the, in what I would call the modern formulation of loop quantum gravity, meaning my own last book on this, uh, uh, there's no manifold. These networks are not defined uh, on a manifold to start with. And so one, one has gone through all this procedure that you just described, uh, and then you throw away the stairs and you say, look, this is the space, it's abstract, it's just function of uh, n copies of the group and, uh, and uh, for each graph, and it's a collection of all the Hilbert spaces attached to each graph. Uh, and uh, they don't represent uh, quantum space sitting somewhere, they just represent the quantum space by themselves. Thank you so much.